When we talk about UK housing, we tend to think of an acute shortage. And it is not surprising, given the fact that house prices have reached nine times income, and we face a crisis of affordability. But do we really need to build 300,000 homes a year, like the government target? In the last decade, the number of households in England and Wales rose 6%, or 1.4 million. But the net number of dwellings in England alone rose by 2 million. Ian Mulhern of LSE claimed in 2018 England had 1 million surplus houses, with a similar situation in Scotland and Wales. The truth is the UK's population has risen slower than previous estimates. Five years ago, England's population was expected to be 57 million, but it turned out to be actually half a million less. In 2014, there was a forecast of 216,000 new households in England per year. But four years later, this was revised down to 150,000. Yet most housing targets are based on this outdated forecast. The number of new households is not growing as fast because of declining birth rates, slower growth in life expectancy, less migration than expected, and the cost of living crisis that is encouraging young people to live with parents, something we could call suppressed household formation. Also, it is not just about the amount of new homes built, but net new dwellings. Last year, England built 210,000 new homes, but gained over 28,000 from the conversion and change of use, e.g. converting business premises to housing. This guy lives in a converted skip, which he says is symbolic of London's housing crisis. Home building rates have fallen dramatically since the post-war period, but it is not the only metric. The 1970s saw significantly higher rates of house building, but there were also more demolitions. This means the net increase in dwellings was actually higher in 2020-21 than the average of the 1970s. So where did the government's 300,000 home building target come from? According to the House of Commons research brief, it comes from outdated predictions in household growth, but was also given a 35% uplift to meet the government's own manifesto pledge. However, at this point, you may ask, if there's no acute shortage, why is it so desperately hard to get housing? Well, in many regions, there is a very genuine shortage, especially for rented accommodation and social housing. Around one in three, over a million, are spending at least half of their household income on rent. And roughly three in 10 say they're now behind or really struggling to keep up with the payments. Chloe's always aspired to own her own home. She works as an estate agent and has seen firsthand how demand for properties has grown in the northeast. When we first started, it was very one for one. You would put a property on the market, it would take a couple of weeks to let. You would do a few viewings and we'd move somebody in straight away. Whereas now, we have people knocking on the door ready to move in before we even get the keys ourselves. Social housing stock has been in steady decline, with former houses been sold off, demolished and not replaced. Shelter report there are 1.4 million fewer households in social housing than in 1980, and 1 million households are currently waiting for social housing. Combined with excessive house prices making homes unaffordable, this has pushed demand into the private rented sector, where supply has been slowed to keep up, especially in certain cities. The result is above inflationary increases in rents, especially in the south of England and big cities. Now, would increasing the supply of houses reduce house prices to affordable levels? One goal of increasing supply is that it would reduce house prices and make them more affordable. Now, this is true to some extent, but less than what you might expect. Numerous studies show that for every 1% increase in supply, prices and rents may fall 1.5%. This would mean if we build 300,000 homes a year, house prices may be 10% less over 20 years, which is an average of 0.5 reduction in house price inflation. Inflated house prices are primarily due to the distortion of ultra low interest rates and wealth inequality. It could mean that the current rise in interest rates will be quite significant in reducing prices. 
Now, the claim that we don't need 300,000 new homes is not settled wisdom. Firstly, we can't just look at the past 10 or 20 years growth in households and supply. We also need to consider past backlogs and suppressed housing demand. A 2019 study at Harriet Watt University claims there is a severe backlog, which includes overcrowding, poor conditions, unsuitable people living together, and young adults stuck with parents. This study claimed we need to build 350,000 new homes a year to get rid of this backlog. It was based on the forecast of 216,000 new households, but also the demolition of unsuitable properties like Grenfell and the additional suppressed household formation. However, before we start digging up the green fields, there are other factors to consider. In England, there are 640,000 empty homes, more than a quarter of a million for more than six months. The worst areas for empty homes are in central London, with investors speculating on rising prices. Nearly one in three homes in the city of London were classified as empty. Also, tourist areas have been hit by the rise of Airbnb and second holiday homes. Cornwall reports 18,000 empty homes, 16,000 on a waiting list for council housing, and 10,000 homes registered for Airbnb. This is Ifley Fields, in the heart of a very desirable part of Oxford, just two miles from the city centre. It is an undisturbed field with significant wildlife, yet there are plans to build housing on these fields which highlights the dilemma for many areas of the UK. Oxford does have a genuine shortage of housing, with prices around 10 times average salaries. Yet to build here would be a loss of greenfield and wildlife habitat, and mean that there's very little greenfield left. It is a difficult choice, with your only alternative to build on the outskirts of a city, or more adventurous solutions like high-rise buildings. What about immigration and the need to build housing? Immigration usually pops up in the comments section. I often see a stat that there were 10 million migrants in the past 10 years. I don't know where this comes from. In the past 10 years, net migration has averaged around a quarter of a million. Last year, it did surge to half a million, though this was primarily a rebound from the 2021 COVID effect where immigration stopped. Leaving the EU has brought down EU migration but so far has been replaced by a rise in non-EU migration. Future migration levels are uncertain, though with labour shortages and more people leaving the labour force, there will be economic pressure to maintain migration levels at current levels. Future population levels are also uncertain, with many Western countries experiencing a bigger fall in birth rates and population than previously expected. For example, Italy's population is expected to decline very rapidly in the coming years, and the UK may start to replicate this kind of trend. So how many new houses does the UK need to build? Arbitrary national targets are slightly misleading, because a lot of the worst shortages are located in certain areas. And more than anything, there is a need to build affordable social housing and housing for renting, something ignored in recent decades. Also, with a rapidly ageing population, we need to create more housing based on the needs of the elderly, which could, in theory, free up space for bigger, younger families. Britain does need to keep building housing, but not necessarily 300,000 a year. To fix Britain's housing crisis, there needs to be other solutions, such as making better use of existing stock, using land where existing planning permission is already there, and in a future video, I will look at more of these options. If you find this video useful, please give it a thumbs up.